thank you, Gospel. Um, thank you, family Nagia, for bringing us today, for bringing us together today. Thank you for calling for building this big tent for us all to gather on our name. And uh, thank you to the lovely ladies in the translation booth for bridging our language differences. Without their work, our gathering would be not as fruitful. I think. So, um, yeah, why the Orion constellation? You might add, ask in my uh, first uh, sheet. Well, it's pretty obvious, I hope. Uh, when we fission uranium atoms, we are basically harnessing the power of dying stars. And Betelgeuse, right over there, is one of those stars that is about to die. May, may take another 10,000 years or so, but you know, in the lifespan of a star, it's like the last second. <laughs> so, um, short introduction. Uh, my name is Matthias Beckers. I'm from the Netherlands. I have two kids. I write books. But I also love to do video, uh, video analysis. I make videos and I love to do energy analysis. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, so yeah. The Paris Report, something everybody is talking about lately. Um, what is the Dutch response to the Paris Report? And I have to give you a little bit of extra information here. Uh, we are about 18 million strong in the Netherlands. Um, our uh, emissions are 200 megatons per year. And we want to cut about half of them. So uh, we want to cut 100 megatons. And we have to do it by 2030. So that's in 10 years. That's a nice challenge. Um, so by 2030, we expect to have about 125 terawatt hours of electricity demand. So this is not energy, this is electricity. So if you look at what we have today, there's a sizable gap. So we only have one gigawatt of offshore wind currently, and we are building another 3.6 gigawatts at this moment. The cost for those 3.6 gigawatts is 6.1 billion euros. Now what nobody tells you is that it also costs another 4 billion euros to attach those windmills from the offshore region to the country. So that's a pretty hefty price tag, which is not shown anywhere. But in any case, we have a sizable gap. We need to grow from 3.3 terawatt hours per year offshore to 49 terawatt hours. A year, which is roughly 11.5 gigawatts, if, if the wind works in your favor. <laughs> so in total, we are missing 19 to 39 gigawatts of wind in total. Not just offshore wind, by the way, but also onshore wind. Now the hidden cost I've alluded to earlier, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, the hidden overnight costs that are not on the price tag of these windmills is 4 billion euros. It's, it's being coughed up by a, 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 an agency which is called Tenet, which also operates in Belgium and in Germany. And uh, it's basically owned by the government for 100%. So the citizens of the Netherlands are fielding this bill. And it might end up costing us between 25 and 30 billion euros for 11.5 gigawatts of wind. Now everybody is always telling us how cheap wind is. Isn't that cheap? I don't know if there's many people here who are adept in, you know, capex costs and all that kind of stuff, but uh, 11.5 gigawatts for 30 billion euros is not cheap. Now, um, there's, there's loads of stuff that is being omitted when people are talking about renewables, they constantly, they constantly uh, omit to say, you know, what the backup is going to cost, how much the extra cost for transmission is. Um, there's also this, this fantastical claim that everybody has to participate. Well, my response to that is, what if I only want electricity as a civilian? I don't want to participate. Give me electricity, I'll pay for your electricity, give me your electricity. But, you know, um, they expect you to buy an electric car and they expect you to leave it on the grid all the time just for the sake of 
you know, having enough capacity when the wind starts, <coughs> which is not really a reasonable thing to ask for. Now, we transfer into magical thinking because right here, this is one of those beautiful pictures that is being provided to us by one of the many agencies in the Netherlands that is pushing the renewable agenda and uh, they are telling us what they are all going to do. Well, in the top left corner, they are still burning gas, which is today's mainstay. Basically, we use gas. The Netherlands is a natural gas company, uh, company country. 99% uh, of all the households in the Netherlands is attached to the gas grid. Um, you know, 50% of all our industry needs are being fulfilled by gas. The next thing you see is a big hydrogen bubble. Uh, we are supposed to make lots and lots of hydrogen using this wind. And uh, down below you see the cars that are still attached to the grid, not driving anyone. So, yeah, I'm a bit skeptical about what they are painting here. It's a nice, it's a nice concept and it might work if you really put your mind to it and you pour all your money into it, which the Netherlands does not do. So, yeah. Um, which brings us to the next problem. Everybody expects their neighbors to bail them out when the wind is in there. So the Netherlands is saying, well, we are going to drop our own generation capacity. Belgium is going to close their nuclear power plants. They're building natural gas plants, but not enough. Germany is doing the same. Sweden is closing a nuclear power plant at this moment. Who's going to take up the slack? Norway, Finland, perhaps Germany, who knows? But they're all doing it unilaterally. Yes, they come together every year, somewhere in Brussels or in Strasbourg, to talk about emissions reductions, but nobody is but nobody is actually thinking and saying, well, uh, what if I cut as much energy as I do and my neighbor does the same and we run out of juice? That's a, that's a sizable problem. So finally, in this little act of mine, um, I think there's three major misconceptions. The first one is energy is not electricity. So cutting 100 megatons <laughs> of emissions from electricity alone, all fine and well, but you still have industry to contend with, you still have heat production to contend with. I don't hear anybody from the renewable camp talking about that. All we hear is electrification. Everybody must electrify everything. Now. It's going to cost you money. I don't know who has that money. I don't. I'm not like other people here, but I can't afford that. Second misconception is that the LCV is system cost. Wind is cheap. Look at the levelized cost of electricity. But nobody talks about the entire system. How much more supply, how much more distribution, how much more transmission, how much more backup you need. Nobody talks about that. And the, which brings us to mis misconception three, low LCV means cheap electricity. That's not true. So, <laughs> time for analysis. I'm somebody I don't really like to take things at face value. This is just a tiny part of the analysis that I've done. So basically what I've done is I've tallied up all the wind parks, all the solar parks, and a couple of nuclear power plants, and I've modeled eight different scenarios for each. So, this serves to give us a range of capital expenditures per plant. So, as you can see, some plants are much more expensive than others. So, in which case, I avoid uh, being, you know, accused of cherry picking, saying, well, you only take the cheapest of this and the most expensive of that, and then you're comparing, and that's not fair. So, I avoid that. Subsequently, what I've done is I've levelized all the discount rates over all the plants and I've acted as if these plants were built in the Netherlands with the capacity factors that are being achieved in the Netherlands. So what we find, and over here, bear with me, there's the EPR. I've used the EPR, the AP1000 and the APR 1400 because we have a large enough information pool. I can, I can, I can grab a load of 
samples and I can model it. So if you build 10 EPRs, that's what you see there, that will cost you between 32 and 115 million euros. Still a lot of money. Still a lot of money, but it will give you a heck of a lot more juice than the windmills. Uh, the 32 billion euro figure is based on Taishan. The high figure, well, everybody knows. Uh, if you want to, the equivalent of 10 EPRs in wind, it is going to cost you between 48 and 275 billion euros. And the equivalent of PV, well, you can see it's depending on the, 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 the confidence of the investors. A lot. But the 561 figure, just forget about it. It's because I want to levelize the discount rate for all, which gives these ridiculous results. So this is something this is something more interesting. Uh, this is levelized cost of electricity. Now you can see that uh, there's the the, 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 the striped bits, those are the bits that are too expensive for the Dutch people. So our electricity is being generated at around 60 euros per megawatt hour. And everything below that in LCOE is profit, basically. So there's the BWRX up there by G. Itachi. We have the AP1000, the APR1400, and the EPR, which, when financed correctly and built on time, might end up being actually pretty sensible. Wind can still be sensible, PV, that's not done. Capacity factors in the Netherlands barely touch 10%. So, solar is out. So this is, I thought that this is pretty interesting. I've also added the Hania X, which is the new largest uh, windmill that you can build. Uh, they claim that they can do 69 capacity factor. I've assumed 1,200 euros per kilowatt which means that you can build a pretty cheap infrastructure, but that's without all the externalities. Nuclear doesn't have those, or at least in much, much lower, lower figures, because, you know, attaching a nuclear power plant to a grid where there used to be a coal plant, for instance, is much cheaper. I mean, that's something I have found. Now, this is an interesting slide that I've stolen from someone else. His name is Joris van Dahl. Don't, don't quote me on these figures, these are not mine. But I found it interesting because what it shows us is that if you look at the strike price of AP point C on the left hand side, uh, if you look at the green bar, that's the interest you have to pay. So basically, the plan isn't that expensive, but the cost of loaning money is expensive. On the other hand, wind, there's much more there's much more confidence that the project will come through, so loaning money is less expensive. However, if you look at the external costs that aren't accounted for, then you get an entirely different picture. And that's what I wanted to show you, it is that nuclear is not inherently expensive. It can be done cheap, but with a whole lot of, you know, <laughs> qualifications and whatnot. So, yeah. That's basically it. Uh, I hope you learned something. Thank you. Presentation. Uh, we have a few questions, I think. Uh, we'll just quickly jump in here. So there's a question regarding a very optimistic or well, optimistic in some sense. Uh, uh, what if the grid is only consisted of, uh, consisted of uh, renewables? Uh, what will determine the price? Will the electricity be free? No, no, by no means. <laughs> no, no, a, a, a recent MIT study uh, actually shows that the, the cost for implementing renewables into a grid rises exponentially after you reach like 50% saturation. So what you basically see is an asymptote, which means that you can add more and more and more and more and more renewables, but it's going to matter less. So that's why the cost shoots up exponentially. And the same MIT study also says, if you add nuclear or CCS, 
then the cost curve will, you know, eventually back down. Not negative, but at least the investments required are much lower. And they're talking about a difference of 30 to 40 percent. So that's in capital cost only. But this also drives levelized costs in the end and system costs. So the less you need to invest, the less you have to build, the cheaper it gets. It's that simple. Thank you. And uh, let's let's try another one. Uh, are you claiming that nuclear has no externalities at all? How do you classify nuclear waste? Oh, that's a that's a nice one. In, in most in most cases, nuclear waste is actually accounted for in the levelized cost of electricity. So most most plants, not all plants, have a decommissioning fund and have a waste repository fund. So. Most of the time, it's just the ratepayer who's basically paying already for the decommissioning. They're paying it up front. Now it's up to the operator to make sure that those funds get appropriated correctly. And sometimes that doesn't happen because they have difficulties or because the market isn't nice to them. And you know, like in Germany, if you if you kill your your nuclear power plants 10, 20 years ahead of time, those funds are not going to be completed, which means that the civilians are going to bear the cost. But that's also a choice they make. So I, 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 won't, you know, I won't cry over spilled milk. So. Thank you, Mr. Beckers.